San Francisco, a city constantly in the news. What's it like living here? Uh, lawless. Yeah. Completely lawless. This yeah. is anarchy. Every day, on average, two people die from a drugs overdose here. It looks apocalyptic almost, like something you see out of a movie. Walk one block, there are signs of improvement. Walk another, it is encampments and people in obvious crisis with seemingly no intervention at all. Yeah, an average of 74 car break-ins a day. That's what's reported in San Francisco, 74 a day. And it's time that the reign of criminals who are destroying our city, it is time for it to come to an end. This city has a minimum of 74 car break-ins a day, or roughly about one car break-in every 20 minutes. Parts of the city have become an open-air drug market, making it unsafe for children even to walk to school without a formal escort for protection. Accidental overdose deaths are up 41% this quarter from last year, with 200 deaths already reported from January to March of 2023. Homelessness in San Francisco is one of the biggest worries the city has currently, counting at least 20,000 people that experience homelessness in the year 2022 and around 46 percent of that homeless population experience mental health battles often untreated even with all that information though we decided a few months ago to take our baby into the heart of san francisco for a week of adventure and exploration we have been shocked at how the city has changed us in the best way possible welcome to our san francisco series I just want to start this video off by showing you footage of Yerba Buena Gardens, a place that Ian and I went to almost every day as we explored the city on our own. The topic of safety in San Francisco is a heavy topic, and hopefully starting off showing you our favorite park there will help provide balance to your perspective before we get into the nitty gritty details. The city of San Francisco has a huge burden to carry when it comes to safety of the people. Resources are not never ending, and a huge resource that the city has said it needs help with is the police force. The city has stated that they are about 500 police short of what they need to do their job. In an hours long hearing at City Hall, SFPD painted the grim picture of its biggest challenge these days, addressing its staffing shortage. SFPD currently has over 1,800 sworn officers. The recommended number, 2,182. The consequence, there just aren't enough officers to get the jobs done. And if you're following the news right now, you'll know that California is sending CHP, which is their California Highway Patrol, in as a backup to San Francisco currently. Yeah, Heather, last week, Governor Gavin Newsom announced that the California National Guard and the CHP were coming into San Francisco to assist local officials here. They also have the National Guard on standby, which means there could literally be boots on the ground in San Francisco. They don't think it's going to come to that, but they're on standby. The California National Guard will also join the effort, not with boots on the ground, but working behind the scenes. We can map cartel networks, both operating in the city and outside the city, understand those networks, build a common operating picture of it, and then work to dismantle those networks. Which is crazy. I guess the big question in my mind when I hear all of that is why? I would like to say that safety is only an issue in the Tenderloin area, but we found that not to be true at all. It may be the most dangerous area, but car break-ins and robberies are happening all over the city to both tourists and locals the same. Stores all over the city are struggling with theft. I'll talk about the difference between Tenderloin and the rest of the city later, but just know that safety is really an entire city issue, not just a Tenderloin issue. First off, I want to talk about the different kinds of safety. San Francisco crime is unique in that it is lower in violent crime, as in like murder, but extremely high in drug and theft crimes. When we were in San Francisco, I stopped in a Walgreens that was really near our hotel to grab some water. It was actually a really long line waiting up for the cat. 
cashiers and they're sitting in line and I saw this guy come in, um, grab something, put it in his pocket and walk out the store and I was like, oh, he just stole something. That itself was like, oh, that's, that was my shoplifting. But what's interesting is about five minutes later, it was a very long line um, with the cashier, I see the guy come back in and all the workers notice him and they call somebody back and he walks down to an aisle and he grabs something. And then an employee comes up and starts addressing him saying, hey, like you've been in here before, like don't make me call the police and just get out of here. The guy just kind of nonchalantly, kind of half ignores him while the guy's sitting there talking, reach over, grabs three or four more Twinkies. He's just grabbing like snack food, grabs a few more, shoves them in his um, sweatshirt. Meanwhile, the employee is sitting there talking to him the whole time being like, hey, I don't really want to call the police. I already called the police on you two or three times. Like, don't make me do that again. Like, you really just need to get out of here and don't stop the trouble. And the guy just wanders himself out and walks away and then it just seemed like it was just a regular occurrence that happened at that store. And that guy said like, yeah, like, I heard him talking to somebody else, like I just pull you to the store, I'm not even hired security, and I just sit here and just talk to him, and they just, you know, he comes back every once in a while. Sadly, theft is so normal there that most of the stores, including places like Target and Walgreens, have armed guards or police coverage, which may have something to do with why the police force is so undermanned. Also, stores like Whole Foods, Nordstrom, and other stores are pulling out of the city altogether. The Nordstrom store opened at the San Francisco Center in 1988 and the rack on Market Street in 2014. The shuttering comes amid a slew of other announced retail closures in the area, including Office Depot, the Container Store, Anthropology, and Saks Off Fifth. The San Francisco Whole Foods flagship, which opened along Market in March of 2022, also announced a temporary closure last month, citing worker safety. It's unfortunate for like the whole community. When we arrived in California, we immediately went to an In-N-Out because yeah, <laughs> we were living up the tourist card on arrival and in the parking lot, there was a fresh break in in the back window of a vehicle. The next day we went to a viewing location of the Golden Gate Bridge in the Presidio State Park and there was a couple from out of state that was cleaning glass out of their car and off their baby's car seat because they had just returned to their car to find the windows smashed in. That was our introduction to the car break-in scene in San Francisco and let me tell you I was nervous about it the rest of the trip when I realized how prevalent it was. I think the most important thing to know about the San Francisco car break-in scene is that it's a full-time career for certain gangs. The fact that gangs are the ones doing the breaking and entering is a problem as it means the incidents are organized events. In my mind, I'm mentally comparing these gangs to the Vikings back in the 10th and 11th centuries. The advantage the Vikings had was speed. They could raid a small village or monastery and be gone way before any backup ever came. What that would look like is a fully armored soldier attacking monks farmers or tiny villages, which was impossible odds for anyone except the Vikings. The Vikings were in and out so fast that by the time someone had time to run and get help from local military men, it was too late. Similarly, the car break-ins are done by professionals. It takes seven seconds to break and grab, and they will always have a getaway car. Often, they will sit there in their car in a parking lot. That way, they can even scope out and pick and choose the best car to break in before they even exit their vehicle and look sketchy. These are impossible numbers. You can't call 911 and have a police there in seven seconds. And if you look online, there is tons of footage of it happening, but you rarely can see their face because, well, they're professionals and they know what they're doing. This is essentially how these gangs earn their living for them and their families. Now, obviously this is bad, but for the city, this is more than bad. This is scary. The city is being forced to think about the repercussions that they could experience by harboring modern day Vikings. A big portion of the city's income is from tourism. Last year alone, the city made over $7 billion 
billion dollars from tourism, which has a lot to do with the Moscow Center. That's even what brought us to the city. Dayton attended a conference at the center that had around 42,000 people attending. In 2022, the Moscow Center held 33 conferences. You do the math. That helps the city out immensely. What if the Moscow Center closes because the risk is too high to ask people to attend? What if people intentionally don't sign up for conferences in the city because they have experienced a break-in? These are really big questions for the city to consider as they still haven't figured out how to crack down on the crime yet. As of yet, most offenders of the law walk free. Do you remember the clip I showed at the beginning of this video of the National Guard stating why they have been dispatched into San Francisco? The California National Guard will also join the effort, not with boots on the ground, but working behind the scenes. We can map cartel networks, both operating in the city and outside the city, understand those networks, build a common operating picture of it, and then work to dismantle those networks. Yeah, that clip. <laughs> So when San Francisco declared war on drugs a few years back, they essentially were declaring war on a multi-billion dollar industry run by drug cartels out of Mexico. There is nothing safe about such an active and alive drug industry off the streets. It isn't safe for the individuals addicted to the drugs who are often sold lethal amounts. Also, drugs in San Francisco are significantly cheaper than other cities, probably because it is a hub and costs less for the drugs to be delivered there. It also isn't safe for the people not addicted to drugs to live in a city where drugs are sold openly by cartel members who live and act like they are their own government above the law. There is nothing safe about this, and though I hope the National Guard will be able to do what they are planning, I have to admit that I'm a bit skeptical. This war on the cartels is not a new one, just like human trafficking is not new. The reality is where there is a market, there is a business and we can spend all of our time fighting these bad businesses, but until we eliminate the demand, the supply is going to keep reappearing. Which is a really good segue into the next chapter of this story, and that's covering the city's response to all of these safety issues. In an effort to protect the people consuming drugs, the city is providing free needles and safe drug houses where people can consume drugs with medical intervention available to prevent spread of diseases or accidental overdoses. There is a lot of criticism over this plan as it begs the question if the city is actually helping the people or just adding to their addiction. But I think it's important to realize while they're busy coming up with a better plan, hopefully the people who do eventually want to get clean will still be alive to embark on that journey. In an effort to protect the homeless, the city is trying to provide free or low cost housing. The biggest problem here is that there are way more people than available housing, which means this plan is not sustainable long term. San Francisco has some of the most expensive housing in the country. So while the plan has holes in it, the city is right. They need to create alternative options for people who are not in that upper percentage. In an effort to protect the community, the city is investing resources into organizations such as Urban Alchemy. This organization is solely responsible for cleaning up the tenderloin, which they send groups into every morning to clean the streets of used needles and human excrement. They also are the reason that the Tenderloin now has playgrounds and more shops and restaurants and stores. The biggest concern with groups doing this kind of work, are you actually fixing the problem or is the problem just being pushed to the next street block or neighborhood. Urban Alchemy is doing such amazing work, but it should be looked at like just one piece in a puzzle of necessary fixes. It cannot be the actual fix itself. In an effort to protect the city from car thieves, 
gangs and cartels, the city is bringing in reinforcement help from the CHP and the California National Guard. This is a huge step towards fighting the real problems in the city rather than just treating the symptoms. This is a very new step as well, so it'll be interesting over the next few years to see how this actually helps shift the safety crisis happening in the city. Historically, the DA and law enforcement have been disunified in their response to these safety issues. But last November, a new DA has filled the role who promises to work with law enforcement and to bring unity back to the city's efforts to obtain safety again. A DA or district attorney is the person who prosecutes whoever the police arrest. So unity is going to be vital in taking gangs and cartels off the streets. Ultimately, there is a lot of criticism on how the city has been handling the safety issues. But for now, I think we just need to applaud the city for doing something at all. There is no immediate fix and there's no clear direction as to like the best way to get there. And from what I see, their efforts are trying to put safety first one step at a time. So that seems like a really good place to start. I mean, it is home to some of the Bay Area's best theaters, best nightlife, civic center, museums. They're all located in this area, but also the home of vices. And those vices have become deadly in recent years. On top of that, it's also a home for thousands of families who are living in apartments that are set aside for actually one person. How did it get that way? Basically because the city made it a containment zone for all of its vices a hundred years ago. Just about every social service in the city of San Francisco is located in the Tenderloin. And this is a challenge that's facing San Francisco and other Bay Area cities as we go forward. If you have problems, do you keep them all contained in one area or do you spread them out? Because if you keep them all in one area, you wind up with something like the Tenderloin. If you spread them out, you often wind up with angry neighbors saying, what's coming into my neighborhood? Why isn't it someplace else like the Tenderloin? Well, those people in the Tenderloin that we said, they're living in small apartments, one bedroom, you know, sharing a bath with somebody else. So that sidewalk, that street corner, that is their living room. They go out there and they hang out. Now, once that happens, however, all these other elements use that for cover and come in as well. That's when you have the drug dealing. That's when you have the drug use. That's when you have the crime. It comes in as well because they feel comfortable there the real question facing is what do we do in a situation like this we're offering services but if they're not taken and those people come in to take advantage of those people that are just living there what do you do about it and who suffers the most i don't want to spend too much time on this chapter but i think it's important to know why the tenderloin is what it is today the city has made it a containment zone which basically means they are permissive to almost anything in this one neighborhood in an attempt to keep it out of the rest of the city this is not a unique thing to san francisco as other cities still have containment zones as well like skid row in la there is much debate around containment zones because while it may do a good job at containing the bad, it also becomes a prison as it contains the good as well. I was able to ask a few questions to a waitress we met while we were there and she shared with us her story of leaving the Tenderloin in order to open a business in Japantown. She shared with us that she hadn't felt safe to walk from where she was living to where she was working by herself. She also shared her disappointment and how little the city had helped the Tenderloin during such a rough patch, which historically, that's how the city's responded to Tenderloin as a containment zone is to be very hands-off, which means anybody living inside has virtually no protection. The positive side here is hopefully that this safety crisis really turns that around and helps the city value the Tenderloin as a safe and affordable location for many people to live. The reality is, San Francisco is generally a safe city to visit and live in. This footage is of us exploring the city while we were there, and though we took safety measures to avoid things like car break-ins, we never felt like our lives were in danger. That may be the case in the Tenderloin area, but as a visitor to the city, we never really had a reason to even go into the Tenderloin. There were moms walking around with their babies all over the city, and people were 
were so nice at restaurants and other locations we visited. Ian made so many friends at local parks who shared balls with him and played with him. We even went to a book reading for small kids in the Salesforce Gardens. If you live smart, don't carry expensive gear around with you and avoid areas where gangs and cartels work, then there is no reason why you should feel nervous about visiting San Francisco. And hopefully after watching our last video on the history and the map of San Francisco, you see the value of visiting and seeing history firsthand. The safety crisis in the city is a really heavy topic. So I'm really excited about the next three videos in this series, which are all about the fun parts and our adventures in the city. If you learned something from this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and hopefully I will see you again next week as our next video is going to be explaining why we were even there and explaining a little bit more about the RSA conference. See you then. Bye!